the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. You are my strength. You are my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, as uh, Pastor Kevin said, uh, we are starting for the next uh, eight or nine weeks uh, a summer series in the Psalms, and I, we want to invite each of you each week to embark upon one of the great mysteries and the great certainties of life in the church and with the people of God. That great mystery and great certainty is that there will be hard times in the life of the believer. That great mystery and that great certainty is that if you haven't faced those hard times yet, the old folks used to say, keep on living. Turn your neighbor and say, keep on living. Tell them again on the other side, keep on living. The great mystery and the great certainty is that there will be questions that may seem impossible for us to answer. Indeed, there will be doubts, and as I even think of the family of Philando Castile this week, as we mourn the one year, do you call it an anniversary of his killing? There will be moments of painful outrage at injustice. There are times, even in the life of faith, when it will seem as though God is nowhere to be found. And yet, we find that there will also be moments of indescribable joy. <laughs> Contrasted with the times when we can't seem to find the words to describe the deep pain and anguish that we feel, there are also times when we cannot even begin to find the words to express our thanksgiving, our praise, our gratitude for a God that somehow does everything well, that somehow makes everything beautiful, we're told, in his time. So this is the story of the people of God. This is the nature of their heartfelt prayers and of the deep lamentations of their hearts. This is the nature of the praises, of their praises unto God. This is the nature of the collection of prayers, of pain, of praises, and of poetry that we call the Psalms. So when you consider the 650 years that it took to write them, and about the 300 years that it took to collect and arrange them, we realize that what we are really looking at here is the end result of about a thousand years of the story of the people of God. Many of the Psalms were written during a time when the nation of Israel had seen the folly of trying to make their nation great or exceptional in the eyes of others. They had erected a share of poles. Uh, they had had orgies. They had seen the folly of going after gods like Baal and money and power. They had come to see the folly of expanding their territory, as we like to say, as king after king after king had become more like the pharaohs from which they were delivered than the God who delivered them. And so they had seen the tragedy of worshiping any god than Yahweh, the one true God of heaven and earth. So the Psalms reflect their journey. The Psalms reflect their story. The Psalms, taken from the Hebrew word tehillim, meaning praises, translated in, through the Greek and Latin to psalmos, is the soundtrack of the life of the people of God. Had C.D. Wonder gotten a hold to the Psalms, they would have been called Psalms in the Key of Life. Amen, Nina. Nina got it. They realized that the great truth is that what we sing shapes us. What we meditate upon is often what we do. What we pray and how we pray is frequently what we truly believe saying to you that we live in a city where songs shape us. 
Oh, I didn't say to say it, but it's cool. I appreciate it. I got early, I got early audience participation. Thank you, Ryan. We appreciate that, brother. You got your chance in a second. You ready? All right. If I if I start, if I start, <laughs> if, <laughs> I love it. We getting trained. We turn this thing into a, a black Baptist church. Is that all right? We going we gonna if I sit up here and whistle this right here. <laughs> Y'all would know that that's what? Somebody knows how to play this game. Okay, how about if I did, um, hold up. If I did, hold on. If I did, we know that's what? Somebody over here watch TV, right here. <laughs> All right, for the 90s babies, hold up. This for, uh, is for me at CC. Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. I like to take a minute, just sit right there. I tell you how I became the... All right. So we understand then that songs shape us. And so after Solomon's temple was destroyed, and the city of Jerusalem is ransacked, the people of God find themselves once again living in bondage, this time not under Egyptian bondage, but now under Babylonian bondage. And you can almost hear their, their cry, you can almost hear their song, the, the, the blues, as they sing in Psalm 137, how can we sing these songs of praise in a strange land? That's how we have felt many a Black History Month. How can we sing this song of praise in a strange land? And when they are finally able to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the city, as they cry out, you can almost picture George Clinton and, 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 and P-Funk, right? Or maybe the Howard University marching band. Maybe for you, uh, a 100-piece orchestra. Mariachi band. Right? As they exclaim in Psalms 150, praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Oh, they get loud sometimes, Josh. Praise him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. These are the psalms that shape us of a people that know that they have lost their way. You can almost hear, you know, you can hear them sing a perfect Miles Davis blues or a Kurt Cobain lament in, in, in Psalm 51, not because just of what David did with Bathsheba, but because they are a people who know that they have committed adultery against their God as they sing, have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions. And my sin is always before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed now rejoice. Hide my face from my sins. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not from your presence, O oh God, and remove not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. 
These are the songs that shape God's people. These are songs written in the key of life. They are psalms that you hold on to when you have nothing else to hold on to. For those of you who study music or have studied music, you'll understand that there are major chords. Amen, huh? There are minor chords, Josh. There are diminished chords. There are suspended chords. There are songs written when our lives are in perfect 4-4 timing, Paul. And then there are, time, there are songs that are written during the times when our lives are in 4-13 timing or 5-12 timing or in the times of sickness, grief, or injustice when the timing just makes no sense at all. So when we realize that we don't have all the answers and we realize that our stuff stinks, and we finally admit these things to ourselves, what do we hold on to? What anchors us? Well, the people of God anchored themselves in the teachings of God, in the Torah, which not only means law, but also means the teachings of God. They anchored themselves in the praise and the worship of God. They told themselves, even as Jesus taught his disciples from the Torah in Deuteronomy 6, that all of the teachings of God can be essentially boiled down into one thing. As they say in Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, known as the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Somebody put your hand over your heart. Only time we put our hands over our heart is to pledge allegiance to an idol. We put our hands over our hearts to pledge allegiance to God. Talk about them when you sit down and at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. And so after all they had been through as a people, after seeing Solomon's temple be destroyed, after rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem, only to see it destroyed again in 70 AD as Jesus prophesied in Mark chapter uh, 13 and in Luke chapter 21, they organized the Psalms into five sections, one for each of the five books of Torah, also known in the Greek as the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They do this as a reminder that in prayer, in lament, and in praise, they are able to write God's teachings upon their hearts. And so understanding that this is a people who fully see the folly of their ways Understanding that this is a people who still anchor themselves in God's teaching and in God's praise. We find ourselves at Psalm 1, which is known as the gateway psalm. Psalm 1 starts with a blessing but contains a grave warning. And Psalm 1 is our text for this morning. If you would, stand with me as we read it together. I'll be reading from the NIV version for inclusive language. It says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. You may be seated in the presence of God. Now, before we get ready to start reading this psalm the way we want to read it, 
I already told you that this is a people who know who they are. They already know that, as Kevin said earlier, we are more messed up than we think we are, more love than we can ever imagine. But they want to start off the Psalms with a blessing. The collection of praises should start off at least with a blessing. It's sort of a beatitude, if you will. But they also started off with a grave warning. They start by saying there is a blessing for the people of God, but they have to watch where they walk. They have to watch where they stand. They have to watch where they sit. First, they have to watch where they walk. See, they've seen, as I said before, their kingdom rise and fall and rise and fall again. And so they warn us to watch where we walk. Now, can I keep this thing real plain this morning? It don't take but about five minutes to be downtown to understand that you need to watch where you walk. Huh? You might find yourself... If you don't watch your step, tell somebody to watch your step. Go on, tell them to watch your step. You don't watch your step in downtown, you mess around stepping in some mess. So um, last time, somebody made a sexist comment at your job about women. What was your response? Somebody say, watch where you walk. Got real quiet on that. Last time somebody posted a racist joke on your Facebook wall, or your Twitter timeline, or at your dinner table, what was your response? Somebody say, watch where you walk. Last time your friends encouraged you to have just one more drink, you knew you was on the edge of being tipsy. Or you told yourself, well, I only had to work a few of my steps. Or that last time he came and, you know, he came over and said, well, we hang out for a minute. We can just hang out and, you know, talk for the night. Tell your neighbor, watch your step. Might find yourself stepping in some mess. But that's not all. They remind us to watch where we stand. Somebody say, watch where you stand. See, we know how this thing goes. It starts off as a casual walk. And before we know it, we're standing on top of a pile, a mess. At first, you know, you and your friends, y'all were cool with saying, you know, we know, you know, there are a bunch of good Latinos, a bunch of good Asians, a bunch of good black people at New City. They're my best friends. I know them all by name, been to their house one time. And then when you get with your other friends, you allow them and you participate either explicitly or implicitly or complicitly, complicitly and their talk about illegals. And before you know it, we've hardened our hearts toward our neighbors, who are the family members of those we say we love. We are quick to forget about the people of God as the people of God were quick to forget about God's teaching in Exodus 23 and 9 and throughout the Torah. And in the Gospels, as Jesus says in Matthew 25, they will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger needing clothes or sick or in prison and we did not help you? He will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. So the psalmist starts by saying, watch where you walk. Somebody say, watch where you walk. He goes on to say, watch where you stand. Somebody say, watch where you stand. But that's not all. He also says, watch where you sit. That's right, because everything we've been through, they've also been through as the people of God. They know that how you walk will determine where you stand, and, and where you stand will determine where you sit. And once you sit down and get comfortable in unrighteousness and injustice, they know how easy it is to make a home in iniquity. But I love that the psalmist doesn't just leave us with a grave warning, but we're also given a picture of the faithfulness of God. If we can root ourselves in the teachings of God, if we can take joy again in devoting ourselves to the ways of God, 
there is this beautiful picture what my brother T.C. likes to call the shalom of God, God's kingdom. There is this beautiful picture of things being the way that they were originally intended. In Psalm 1, you can almost see the image of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. That person, it reads, is like a tree planted by the rivers of water who bears its fruit in season. Have to wait some time. I love this message because this is the message of the gospel for us. I love this image because the Psalms are full of prayers that show that these are people that know they don't have it all together. They know that they toe up from the flow up, as we like to say. They know that they are full of ugliness and are wayward of heart. But yet if they can just think and meditate on the goodness of God. If they can think and remind themselves when they were stuck in the muck and the mire and that it was God who was the one that picked them up, that turned them around and that planted their feet on solid ground. We used to say in the church, oh, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me, my, my, my soul cries out hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. There's good news in the song. The good news of Psalm 1 is that the tree cannot plant itself. I said the tree cannot plant itself. The good news of Psalm 1 is that there is no amount of effort. There's no amount of trying, of striving, of earning, of positioning, of of jockeying, of self-righteousness that can ever get a tree to plant itself. When last time you saw a tree plant itself? good news of Psalm 1 is that the truth of what we know in our hearts is that when we are honest, we know we don't deserve to be planted. The good news of Psalm 1 comes when we know that we are the wicked. Regardless of how we might have wanted to try to read that, that text, think about somebody else, we are the ones who not only walk in step with the wicked or stood in the way of sinners, but we are also the ones who sat right down and made ourselves at home in the seat of those who mock the faithfulness, the love, and the righteousness of our God. Every time that we rejected God and went our own way, we sat right there in the seat of the mockers. Every time that we relied on our own intellect or resume, or as we like to do in the church, our own personal testimony, without, without, without owning our own mess, we sat right there in the seat of the mockers. Every time that we went and pointed the finger at those people, without looking at the beam, as Jesus says, in our own eye, we sat there in the seat of the mockers. There's room for righteous indignation. For justice, we got to watch ourselves, my brothers and my sisters, lest we sit in the seat of the mockers. But God. But God is the one that picked us up. God is the one that dusted us off. God. God is the one that taught us through his teachings how to delight ourselves in the Lord. And that he will give us the desires of our hearts when our hearts are yielded unto him. God is the only one who was able and is able to plant us in his word, in his will, and in his ways. That's why Paul prayed in Ephesians 3, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and grounded in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that this love surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So know a tree can't plant itself. Tell your neighbor, a tree can't plant itself. 
Wake the person up on the other side. Say, the tree can't plant itself. No, God is the one who does the planting. God is the one that roots our heart in his love. That's why I love the Hebrew word here that's translated in our text as planting. That word uh, planted is actually the Hebrew word shotal. Y'all, everybody say shotal. Yeah, that's like y'all speaking Hebrew bonic. Shotal. Shotal. Shotal is actually the word that means to transplant. Somebody got that. That means that we serve a God who knew where we were but that placed us where we're going. Now, I, I mean, ain't about 2% of y'all that's actually from L.A. Raise your hand if you're actually from L.A., for real, for real, from L.A. Like I said, like, okay, eight hands. Okay, that ain't bad. But God is the one that transplants us. Mo- I'm a transplant. Everybody in here transplant. But we understand that God is the one that took us from where we were. And it's bringing us to where he's sending us. This is why Jeremiah is able to say in Jeremiah 17, the only other place we even find this same word, shotal. Say it again, shotal. Only reason, only other place in in the Hebrew Bible we are able to find this word is in Jeremiah 17, that he writes to a people that he's warning about exile. It says, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water. It sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. But then it says something curious. This is why I asked you to put your hand on your heart earlier. It then says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I love that God then goes and puts this prophecy in his, in his mouth in Jeremiah 31. If you listen, you'll hear how God is transplanting us. It says, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. You hear Psalm 1? I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor, as we are prone to try to do, or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their sins and remember their sins no more. That's good news, y'all. And that is what it means to have our hearts transplanted. I'm talking about our individual hearts and the heart of the church, and the heart of any system or nation that is in the hand of a God who has planted us. And in that great process, we understand what what Manny and Pastor Kevin taught about a few months ago, that this is what we call life change from the heart. Look, every single one of us understands that we're not there yet. Every single one of us understands that we're, 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 we're not where we were, but we're not where we want to be. Each and every one of us understands that we are in the process of being transplanted by our God. That's why we don't read Psalm 1 as talking about those folks or or, or some other church or some other nation. We read Psalm 1 and we see ourselves. But when we see ourselves, we also see our God. We see our God, and that's why even when we look around and the facts of life seem to defy this blessing that we see in Psalm 1 or the hope of what, it is, of what is promised, we know that God is not finished with us yet. We're being transplanted. God's not finished with creation yet. We're being transplanted. And though we look around and no sooner than Psalm 2 are we faced with a question of why. We start Psalm 1 with a blessing, and in Psalm 2 are we faced with the question of why. Why do the nations conspire against God? And we remember that we are planted and being transplanted. And when we cry out like, like Psalm 2 or what we hear in the voice in the mouth of Christ on the cross when he says, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? We remember that we were planted 
and we are being transplanted. And when we stand yet asking the question why with Sojourner Truth when she stands up in the middle of a convention full of folk that are supposed to be feminists and she says, ain't I a woman? We remember that we are planted and being transplanted. When Rosa Parks has, Parks has the nerve to say, why do I have to give up my seat? We remember that we are planted and being transplanted. When Cesar Chavez has the nerve to ask the question, or Dolor Dolores Huerta has the nerve to ask the question, why aren't Latino Americans given the same livable wage or the rights as their, other, as their other neighbors? We ask ourselves the questions, why? But then we say, I remember, we're planted, but we're being transplanted. And when we ask ourselves with Nelson Mandela, why, why should there be a legal system of apartheid for my Bantu brothers and sisters? We remember that we were planted, but we're being transplanted. Or if we ask ourselves, why are the stories of Korean comfort women untold? We remember that we are planted, but being transplanted. Planted. Or, the, or the stories of the many women right here in downtown who are being trafficked. Hello, somebody. We remember that we are planted, but we are being transplanted. Amen, my sister. With the Psalms, until things are blessed and until they prosper, as they should, we must keep asking God why. I said no sooner did we finish with Psalm 1 than are we faced in Psalm 2, and truly the rest of the Psalms force us to face this question of why. When we ask that question the Psalms teach us to ask, we remember that we were planted. God didn't make a mistake with us. We are planted and we are being transplanted. That our hearts are on a journey with all of God's people who were planted and being transplanted. And we are warned, yes we are warned, that if we do not change our ways that the road that we are on will surely lead to destruction. But the blessing, the reason to bring to Helam praises unto God, is that there is a God that we serve who came and planted himself in us planted himself in creation. He said the kingdom of God is like a what? A seed. Planted. And he planted a kingdom and a new way. And he promises us that it is a way that leads to life and life more abundantly. He promises us, as Psalm 1 does, that it is a way that does not wither, but will ultimately prosper. So I hear the revelation of Jesus that he gave unto John on the Isle of Patmos in the 22nd chapter of Revelation. You'll remember it from our series we did a while ago. It says, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the lamb down in the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were there for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. That's us. They will see his face. And his name will be written on their foreheads, and there will be no more night, my sister. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them the light, and they will reign forever and ever. Please pray with me. Jesus, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you that you are the word made flesh that has taken root and is taking root in each of our hearts. 
for the seed of your word that you have planted in this hour. I pray right now against the enemy that would seek to devour it. Would you protect the precious seed in the name of Jesus Christ of your word? Hallelujah. Protect your seed. Hallelujah. Protect what you're doing in every heart in this place. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.